welcome to this video podcast, which is part of the series 30 Years, 30 Cases, which the Academy of European Law era is launching to celebrate its 30th anniversary. My name is Lady Maiso, and I'm a deputy head of the private law section at ERA. In this podcast, we will address the cases of 2007, Viking and Laval. The Viking and Laval cases raise the question of the relationship between market freedoms and fundamental social rights. The Court of Justice was asked to clarify the extent to which collective action may be used to restrict the freedom to provide services and the freedom of establishment. The case the cases arose in the context of the then recent accession of 10 new member states and the fear amongst trade unions and workers in the old member states that their economic and social position was being threatened by service providers bringing lower paid Eastern European labor to fulfill contracts. These cases uh, received a great amount of public, political and academic attention. Professor uh, Jean-Philippe Lerno will present the cases in this video. He is a law professor at the University of Poitiers and is an expert on European labor and social security law. Today, we are going to talk to outstanding cases of the Court of Justice, the well-known Viking and Laval cases of December 2007. Both cases address the fundamental question of the extent to which the right to strike can be limited for internal market reasons. Let's start with the facts and the legal questions raised by both cases. In the Viking case, first of all, the matter is about freedom of establishment and the right to collective action. Viking is a company subject to Finnish law. It's a ferry operator. One of vessels, Rosella, uh, runs under the Finnish flag and plies the route between Tallinn in Estonia and Helsinki in Finland. The crew of the Rosella are members of a trade union in uh, Finland, but also are affiliated to the ITF, an International Federation of Transport Workers Unions. As long as the Rosella was under the Finnish flag, Viking was obliged under Finnish law to comply with the rules applicable in Finland. The problem is that the Rosella was running at a loss as a result of direct competition from Estonian vessels operating on the same route with lower wage costs. As an alternative to selling the vessel, Viking sought in October 2003 to reflag it by registering in Estonia. FSU, the trade union, indicated that it would only accept such renewal under two conditions. First of all, that Viking would continue to apply Finnish law and local collective bargaining agreement. And secondly, that this new flag would not lead to any laying off of employees. Some years after, Estonia became a member of the European Union. And since the Rosella continued to run at a loss, Viking pursued its intention to reflag the vessel to Estonia. FSU, the trade union, gave notice in accordance with Finnish law that it is intended to commence strike action in relation to the Rosella. And the legal question in that case before the Court of Justice was, does the treaty prohibit trade unions action aimed at preventing an employer from exercising his right of establishment for economic reasons? Before answering this question, let's look at the Laval case, look at the facts and the legal questions. The topic is slightly different. It's about free movement of services and the right to take collective action. Laval is a company subject to Latvian law. In 2004, it posted around 35 workers to Sweden 
for the construction of school premises in a small city in Sweden. Laval was not bound by any Swedish collective agreement. Bigoten, a Swedish trade union, demanded that Laval first sign the collective agreement for the building sector applicable in Sweden, in particular applicable in the tax on site where the construction was being carried out. And secondly, the Swedish trade union required that the posted workers be paid an hourly wage of approximately 16 euros. That hourly wage was based on statistics on wages applicable in the region. And at the same time, Bigotin declared that it was prepared to take collective action in the event that Laval failed to agree to this. After all, Laval did not agree to that amount. It agreed to pay a monthly salary of approximately 1,500 euros plus meals and accommodations. That was not sufficient for the Swedish trade unions. And since the negotiations were considered to be not successful, blockading of the site was decided and begun in November 2004. The blockading consisted of preventing the delivery of goods onto the site, placing pickets and prohibiting Latvian workers and vehicles from entering the site. As a result, Laval was boycotted not only on this site, but also throughout Sweden by all local trade unions. Finally, Laval's subsidiary in Sweden went bankrupt because of lack of business. In this case, the legal question was the following one. Is it compatible with the principle of free movement of services and with the posting rules for a trade union to attempt, by means of collective action, in the form of a blockade, to force a foreign provider of services to sign a collective agreement leading to the application of Swedish regulation. Before giving the answers to these cases, it's interesting to explain why these cases are so crucial. These two, two cases illustrate a well-known paradox of EU construction. The first goal of the European Union is to guarantee the widest possible freedom of movement for economic operators. But this economic integration is meeting strong resistance in the field of employment law. Indeed, internal market rules open the way to opportunistic behavior. Economic operators may try to avoid social constraints of some countries, which are considered by them overly restrictive by using internal market rules. In order to combat what they consider to be an abusive circumvention of national labor rules, workers and their representatives may seek to impose the application of their national labor standards. And that's where the confrontation between free movement rules and labor law rules become inevitable. And that was exactly the point in those two cases. However, the question is renewed in those cases, though since state regulation is not directly involved. In Viking and Laval, the challenge is to see to what extent employees and their representatives can act in defense of their interests against private companies which will put forward economic rules of the European Union. Now let's look at the court's decisions and let's start with Viking. The first uh, um, interesting element, very important uh, point of the decision is in favor of workers. According to the Court of Justice, the right to take action including the right to strike, 
is recognized as a fundamental right which is part of the general principles of EU law. This is great for workers, however, the case also delivers information which is more favorable to companies. Indeed, contrary to what trade unions were claiming, the court considers that collective action initiated by a trade union against a private undertaking falls within the scope of the rules of a treaty concerning free movement of establishment. But the court also indicates that the rules of a treaty on freedom of establishment have a horizontal effect. They may be relied on by a private undertaking against a trade union. But more importantly, for the court of justice, the fundamental right to take action is subject to certain restrictions and that is what we call the justification and proportionality test. Let's look at those two tests concerning the justification. The Court of Justice rules that protecting the jobs and conditions of employment is a legitimate aim for the trade unions to act. However, the Court considers that jobs and conditions of employment at issue must be jeopardized or under serious threat to justify the action of the trade unions. Concerning the proportionality test, the Court of Justice considers that trade unions must have no other means at their disposal which are less restrictive of freedom of establishment to justify the action undertaken. What does it mean in practice? For that case, it means that collective action, which seeks to prevent ship owners from registering their vessels in another member state, must be considered to restrict Viking's exercise of its right of freedom of establishment. And that restriction, if it may be justified by an overriding reason of public interest, such as the protection of workers, has to be justified and proportionate. Now let's look at the Laval ruling. Again, the Court of Justice rules that the right to take action, including the right to strike, is a fundamental right. But again, the Court of Justice rules that the justification test must be passed. Yes, social dumping is an overriding reason of public interest. But, in this case, the Court of Justice makes a narrow interpretation of a posting directive. The Court of Justice considers that a member state in which the minimum rates of pay are not determined by law or by universal agreement, which was the case in Sweden, is not entitled to impose on undertakings established in other member states negotiation at the place of work. Also about the posting directive, the Court of Justice considers that Article 3.7, which provides that the directive does not pre preclude the application of more favorable terms and conditions of employment for workers, does not allow the host member state to impose terms and conditions of employment going beyond the mandatory rules of minimum protection. What does this case mean in practice? It means that EU law precludes a trade union from attempting, by means of collective action in the form of a blockade of sites, to force a provider of services established in another member state to enter into negotiations with it on the rates of pay for posted workers and to sign a collective agreement. Which comments can we make about these two cases? What do they mean in practice? In sum, under the influence of economic freedoms, strikes are subject to a control of motives, opportunity and intensity, 
aimed at evaluating whether the workers' representatives had good reasons to act, and if so, whether they could not have used alternative means of action understood as less prejudicial to the freedoms of the internal market. The court's solution organizes an unequal relationship between economic freedom and social objectives. By definition, collective action reduces the internal market freedom of the employer. This obstacle needs to be duly justified by trade unions. The European court, but also national courts, will be able to exercise strict control over this justification. There is therefore a risk of collective action being placed under judicial supervision. In other words, the validity of an action by trade unions, its relevance, is not left to the free assessment of the interested parties themselves. The court is thus depriving the trade unions of an essential part of their powers, and that can be considered to be in contradiction with the autonomy of the partners. The equivalence between the social and economic aims of the European Union thus seems to be still very fragile when we read those two cases. Let's now finally look at the evolution since these two cases. Viking and Laval have not been overruled. However, some evolution can be looked at. First of all, Article 28 of the Charter provides that trade unions have the right to negotiate and conclude collective agreements at the appropriate levels and in cases of conflicts of interest to take collective action to defend their interests, including strike action. That's a powerful rule that will probably be very useful in the future. But that's not all. If you read the new posting directive, it's clearly written that this new directive on posting shall not in any way affect the exercise of fundamental rights to strike or to take other action covered by the specific industrial relations systems in member states. Let me finally refer to a recent case of a court of justice in the field of consumers' law. This is the Air Help case of March 2021. In that case, the court rules that, despite embodying a moment of conflict in relations between the workers and the employer, whose activity it is intended to paralyze, a strike nevertheless remains one of the ways in which collective bargaining may manis manifest itself and therefore must be regarded as an event inherent in the normal exercise of the activity of the employer concerned. I think this case will or may lead to subsequent cases uh, uh, promoting the right to strike and perhaps leading to a different ruling than uh, Viking and Laval.